Yeah. You look so cool. You got a hat? I thought, well, first... I just found this hat. My mom asked me to bring it home. Ah. So it's like my grandfather's bowler hat. But uh, I thought, hey, I just saw it. It does look like a bowler like hat. Danny. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. So you are Taylor Shell, bassist of Tourquoise, and you guys are sort of a big deal right now. I don't know about – well, yeah. yeah I mean, I don't <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> <laughs> but nice we go to say how about that? <laughs> yeah, but we go way back. It's What's so weird. That? We we go way way back till the beginning of time. I think yeah. we, started, we started being friends right when time started. Do you remember how we met? Because I I don't really. I I, I think I actually do, and it's a great story. Me and Noah were jamming in a, a basement room at Berkeley, like one of those practice rooms in the bottom of 150, I think. And you, I think maybe Noah had met you somewhere, but you just came in and started playing. And I didn't even uh. didn't shake your hand or meet you. And I think maybe Noah like kind of knew you. And it was amazing. I remember you had that 335 and you were playing all, you were like in all the prepared guitar stuff. You were playing all crazy. Yeah, and we had, uh, yeah that, 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 was, that, was, that was wild times. Yeah, that was great. I mean, and that was we, I think like first or second semester at Berkeley maybe. That was like, yeah, so this must have been like 2005. Yeah, yeah, totally. Something, something like that. <laughs> yeah. I remember like, you know, those those early days, like, you know, when, when the three of us were playing, that was like a period, I never had an experience like that before or after. Yeah, me, me ever. I have we the would, same, same memory. We would get together, like, like, we would play for like, you know, three, four hours, like a few times a week sometimes. Yeah, it was like, a, mo it felt like most nights or at least a couple nights a week. And you remember you had the uh, like the key to that one practice room, like the teacher room or whatever, so we could uh, right we could go and like we didn't have to like rent it out and like plan it ahead, so we just be like yo meet me, which was, yeah that was really yeah cool. it was it was so so weird because I remember just like you know when when you're improvising like especially like in a power trio setting like you know like bass guitar and drums you run into like this wall of like all the shit you you know how to do right 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 within like you know an hour and a half two when, hours of playing for anyone watching too like danny and i had a band with our friend noah called slow drag for a bunch of years when we were in college and it was all improvised uh like every show everything was improvised although it, maybe we wrote some stuff by the end but by the end yeah it's it all improvised though which yeah, was yeah yeah that, that was the whole concept and improv shows and, you know. and but it was like grooving, right? That that was like yeah. the idea was like well, to have these. You had, you had free beer trio, which was like insanity prepared guitar time, and then this was like groove time. Was yeah, that's what, what I recall. It was it was groove time, and you know, we're like yeah. we had we had Noah in the band, so like you know, Noah. Uh, I actually just played a gig with Noah last night. Oh really? How's he doing? Yeah. I owe him a phone call for sure. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen him in years. He's doing well, you know. We were playing some jazz kind of stuff um but but yeah i mean that was that was such a strange kind of thing because it was like really always like pushing like none of you know none of us were like tight players like back then we were kids yeah you yeah. know but but it you was like faster huh <laughs> no no i'm sorry <laughs> i have i have i have records <laughs> i know i know I have, it's like you can't you can't fool, you can't fool, uh, fool the old record. But it's like that. It was so weird. Like you know, I think that that experience like was so so unique. I don't think many people had that. That went to school of just putting themselves in a one hundred percent improvised kind of thing, and you just get to throw all of vocabulary or pieces of vocabulary or potential groove ideas that you had have sound like everything in this pot and just kind of flush it out you know and keep well, flushing it out and i think we all were like the three of us were like very committed to figuring out what type of adult professional musicians we were gonna be so it was like right. also just a cool time i think for that level of like obviously improvisation is you know where you're trying to find things you didn't know were already there or whatever and and i think that it was an interesting time because that was sort of where we were all at in our lives anyway being you know kind of 20 or whatever and trying to figure out okay we all want to be professional adult musicians and we're all high school or whatever musicians growing up but how did how does that transition happen 
I sure. Do we, conversation you, you actually part of that, you know. You came so, from like a different kind of background because you were in a kind of successful band in high school already, right? I mean, I we I wouldn't yeah, or I wouldn't say successful exactly, but I, or maybe we I was in bands from the you time. You were playing I, big shows. I, yeah, or we, I played shows, you know, that people came to since I was pretty young. I was in like a hardcore punk rock band when I was like 12 and that progressed and we got to play at like Gilman and cool like punk rock clubs in the Bay Area, which is like that's where like Green Day started and lots of yeah. what that scene is from. So you yeah, must have looked so adorable. What's that? Yeah, the pictures are amazing. I wish I could show you. Them. I actually have somewhere around here. Have shots of us thinking we were pretty fucking cool. <laughs> Taking band photos, like leaning on yeah, a wall, totally like, like all looking in one direction. No facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that that certainly changed. Yeah. All right, so we had we had that all the good times in college the thing, together. The thing about that that I wanted to just the other thing that I that I always think about in terms of those like you know hours and hours and hours and hours of time we spent improvising together was that we would do cool exercises. Do you remember some of those like improv exercises where like one person would take like one of the three of us would have to play one pattern for like an hour while the other two people couldn't repeat anything they were doing for an hour and play or maybe we maybe we time maybe it's less than that maybe it's like 30 minutes because that sounds extreme um and then i remember another one where we all wore blindfolds and played together for like two hours with like uh our eyes totally closed oh, man that's that's, it's, it's amazing like, could like somebody I, convince I, you to I, do that I, shit you know, now getting together with my friends and be like i got an idea everyone blindfolds we're gonna just not you know repeat ourselves for two hours but, like, that was the coolest thing about that. Yeah, because it's like nobody would do it now because they just, like, Google on their iPhone and be like, is blindfolding helpful for improvisation? Yeah. It's like, oh, guys, it's, like, it. uh, it's, it's not, not. going to work. <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> Although it was, it, it was a good memory. I think, yeah, yeah, those were really fun. Those were really fun. I'd love to listen back. We have so many hours of recordings, too. So I, think we were I don't have them. Do you have them? I think Noah has, like, all that. Yeah. Really? Sure. Wow. I'd love Unbelievable. To yeah, me too. So, okay, you, at the same time that this was going on, you started making music with Dave Brandwine. We started Turquoise, you know, in, I guess the last, I mean, I don't know that we start. the band didn't come to exist really until later, but Dave and I lived together and we made all the, the first demos and made the stuff, you know, along with a bunch of friends. Mm -hmm. And what was the process like in the early days? Of making the original demos. Yeah. The way the band came to be was kind of funny. We made the album with no, the first sort of album that we called a dollar store and called the band Turquoise, which were the two stores right next to our apartment in Alston in Boston. <laughs> but with no intention of it being like a band, it was just a recording project. And then our friend John Wilson submitted that recording to Heavy Rotation. You remember like the Berkeley uh -huh. record label? And they asked us to do the showcase. So we like, anyway just kind of put together friends that were around and went and played the showcase and then the band sort of slowly came to form over the next period of time mm -hmm. but and what was what question. was like a, what was the first like turning point in like the band's i guess like the move to new york was a pretty big deal yeah, like that was kind of that was part of it i guess yeah the move to new york i mean you know it always felt right i think like mm -hmm. it always like i don't know if that makes sense but even from, makes like, total first, sense even from like the first recordings, at least for me, and I think for Dave too, and I, you know, I think to, for everyone that's been involved with it, it's just, it had a click, something clicked about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it never felt like uh, a question as to whether it was going to be like something I was going to put all my energy into. Mm. But yeah, when moving to New York was part of it. But when we moved to New York, there was like three years where we kind of, we didn't play a ton. We'd play like maybe three shows a month or three or four shows a month and Dave, Dave booked all this Dave worked so hard he books all the first years of touring and all that but it was sort of a slow build and then in like 2012 when we got our booking agent that was like all right you guys are on the road whatever 160 dates or more a year was was the first point at which it became like uh, mm. you, you could feel the growth I guess you know what I mean yeah yeah sorry I disappeared there for a second uh, but you could feel the so and what was the booking agency you had the first one was uh the one that does consider the source and all these guys right yeah it was called uh hoplite with this guy hoplite and but now you know and um and you were with them for a few years right 
Yeah. Yeah, a few years. Yeah. Like so we, <laughs> this is what? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, it got, the relationship got a little messy, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, that, that was, happens when yeah. you transition, like, you know, anytime you have like some, some yeah. sort of like successful business thing and you have to take a different route, it's never pleasant. Cause yeah. that, like that person's like, I worked so hard till we, till we're making money. And it's like, yeah, that's life. Uh, you chose your profession and it happens with every band. <laughs> if, if there's a success story, um, yeah, yeah, but this is definitely a say la vie kind of uh, kind of thing. Tough business, obviously. So. Yeah. So with with Turquoise, once you started like you know doing shows like with a booking agent, things kind of start. This is what year? Like 2012. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, before that, you know, we played like we we did some touring. We went out to California uh, a couple times. We like we would play the Northeast. We'd go up to Boston, and the, there was cool shows. There'd be you know some people at the shows, and they were really. I mean, they were in my memory super fun and crazy. But uh, yeah, in 2012, I think is when we all decided to take it more like a business and like and basically make it so the calendar your calendar goes the other way. It's like you're available for shows always unless you're not. Instead of you're not available for shows. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I know you know. That's, I know exactly. That's, what that's, a, that's a distinction, I think. That, yeah, girl, I have just a, like, you know, my girlfriend's birthday. <laughs> right. These are the <laughs> put in to be like, you want to be nervous. Danny has like his wife's birthday, his kid's birthday now. It's just like, plink, plink. Don't, don't do those two. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and those ruin entire tours. They're like, oh my God, we can't go out in May. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, that, that's so that funny. Was, I think for us in 2012, that's All when right. that flip happened. That every band that tours hard knows. That so, that's, so that's, let, let's 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 interweave this with uh, because this seems like you know turning points in the band's kind of kind of uh, path. But tell tell me a road story from from pre 2012. <laughs> Needs to have drugs, Put on hookers, you. mountains of blow. It's all it's all wonderful. All there. No. Yeah. I mean, you know, shit. What happened? <laughs> I don't know if I, it's hard to just come up with one off the top of my head. I mean, there's like countless insane things that have happened. Start with the first one. What, oh. What's an insane thing that happened? <laughs> I don't know if I can do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we're fairly ram. We used to be a fairly rambunctious bunch, <laughs> and yeah. you know, traveling on the road with. 10 to 15 people it's sort of like you bring the party everywhere you go this is another thing we, i was talking to mark from snarky puppy and you know on this thing and the logistics of yeah. traveling with a band that size before you even have a booking agent like you know before all that like it was what, what what was it like what, I, what did I you guys remember, do for sleep like, i remember <laughs> i mean i remember like you know normally we would finish the show and then like walk out into the audience and be like who's down to have us all come to their house <laughs> And like when that wouldn't work, everyone would like like drunkenly book like one Motel Six room and like all like we would all. I remember in the trailer there was a whole section of like sleeping bags and pads, so we could basically like sardine out, you know, in one room, which we. Oh did. my god! Did you ever get busted by the hotel being like you're not supposed to have yeah, 14 people yeah, in here? Sure, yes. There was arguments. I mean, there was a lot of crazy late night stuff like that where you. You argue with the guy, you tell him you were leaving, and then you like sneak back, you know, <laughs> into the room. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty it, awesome. Pretty quick, we, we'd probably get two or three rooms. But I, I remember one time in particular where we were playing like, somewhere in like northern Maine, and rooms were like, you know, 300, Insane. which for us was like not going to happen. We got one, and, you know, it was like a whatever mom and pop type of deal. And uh, they were not happy about it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of, you know, there was just a lot of like, I mean, we all kind of grew up to be on the road or spent our 20s on the road, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was just a lot of, there's sort of countless like after party, crazy meeting people, funny times, scary times. What like, the scary times? What's the scaredest you've been? One time we, <laughs> I don't know about the scaredest, but one time we pulled into the fucking uh, Telluride <laughs> and uh, we pull into town. And there's a there's like a probably a three or four hundred pound black bear or brown bear just walking around in the middle of the street 
And Craig gets out of the van. He's like kind of stoned. He gets out of the van. Didn't know. Thought we were joking. <laughs> Starts walking off. And we're like, dude, it's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge bear. And he found out and ran back into the, the van. <laughs> That's pretty scary. That was sort of scary, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Dude. other other less flattering stories I won't share, but, you know. <laughs> you got it. That's what this show is for, man. Uh, I, mean, <laughs> but I'm, I mean, I'm trying to think. I can't, I, there's, it's the kind of thing, like, if you catch me in the right moment, I'm like, oh, yeah, that happened. But it's Yeah, like, I remember the story <laughs> where, when uh, you played a set with uh, Consider the Source because somebody... <laughs> Like, uh, put, oh, put yeah. acid in John's like, drink. Yeah, John got dosed or something in the green room. Yeah, that's right. And he came up to me like, dude, uh, I need you to go play our set right now. I can't do it. And I'm like, you guys' music is really fucking hard, man. I don't think I'm going to be able to go do that. And we had finished our set, and it was New Year's, and I was pretty lit, truth be told. Uh, and yeah, so I was like, I'm on drugs too, motherfucker. <laughs> And I got up there. And but you can I, handle it. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because John Ferrer, it's like all like Victor Wootney kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I'm just sitting there happy. Like, you guys want to like, you know, <laughs> move down here. How about Sensi Strat? You guys know Sensi Strat? <laughs> all right, do that in seven though. All right. <laughs> no, I love those guys. Consider the source. Funny. Yeah, it's so funny. Well, you saved their asses. That's probably a big show it, for them. It was it wasn't a small show. I'm trying to remember where that was. Maybe it's in Boston. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I talked to John Ferrer about this, and he said afterwards that like the, he knew the guy, and the guy just trying to help him. The like guy some, who gave him the guy the guy who dosed him with acid, and he never he never had acid before, so right. he was freaking I, out, I guess. He was like, "Dude, I've never taken acid before. I cannot go on stage right now." Yeah. Well, I can relate to that feeling. I guess I'll go on stage right now. <laughs> Yeah. Could you imagine like, you know, you, you getting like too high on acid and then like having John come out instead of you? Oh, I would go out. <laughs> no, <you'd, yeah. laughs> I've gone out there in some adverse circumstances before. Battle my way through a few sets. What what was the what was the biggest struggle to get through a set? Oh no well the other night was kinda tough, but <laughs> <laughs> what happened? No, nothing. I just I, I made a I had that thing where like I made two mistakes like early in the set and it was hard to couldn't leave me. I fucking hate that. Yeah. Oh, so because yeah. you because you know the show is ruined. That that's oh, that's right. the thing. Because yeah, totally. you because you know that objectively there are better shows. Well, right. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's also just you know I think that's that's a, especially when you're doing it every day and you hold yourself to a certain standard that it, there is a thing that's tricky that happens sometimes when you make one or two mistakes, the ability to let go of them and not have it ruin the rest of the show is like a hugely important part of being a professional, I feel like. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing to do sometimes. Especially yeah. like a late tour when you like, the, like the, everything's kind of locked in. You know, you I don't like, yeah. And it's, tight and it's just like, if you're the one letting it down, it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> And the look you get too, it's like oh. when the head spin your way, it's like, we got to <laughs> better about that. There, when, when it was the harder party and band, there would be some, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I remember some onstage arguments. <laughs> it's like, guys, everyone's looking at us right now. Stop fucking about this shit. <laughs> we're, we're in Red Rocks, guys. <laughs> this is not appropriate. <laughs> we fought there. It was more like, you know, Stella Blues in New Haven or something. <laughs> yeah. How, how intensely did you guys, did you guys ever fight, fight? No, no, no. I'm just, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, we've ar we've all argued. You know. Yeah. Well, arguing is part of life. Well, especially when you have ten people. Yeah. And you guys run nine, like this. Nine, it seems nine. like a democracy. I mean, you know, I don't know exactly if I. Well, yeah. I mean, we all. It's there's a ton of care, and and everyone's opinion is heard as best as can be in that situation. I think there's times when executive decisions have to happen because when you have that many people, if that doesn't happen, then that can be its own problem. But um. Generally, you know, I, I think that we do as good a job as as we could as we possibly could of, you know, kind of taking everybody's opinion into account. Mm. Because, you know, that everyone's based their life on. It's like no one's getting paid enough for it to you know, it's like this is a group collaborative creative effort that is not realistic really. Yeah. 
<laughs> like, you know, and so for that, it's, you know, the whole, I think that, you know, people being heard is really important. Well, how did they, how did everybody in the band figure out survival for the first years, like traveling so many people? I would. I mean, I just, we, we were in a one van with, I think we had 12 at the time uh, for, you know, I think we did 160, 180 dates in, you know, drove, I think I, on my taxes, I think I reported that I drove 73,000 miles in like whatever one year. Um, yeah. So, you know, we just kind of did it. I think, I think it was also the thing I was like when we were at school is the same thing of everyone wanted to have a band that they could go be at a, a band in. Like, this is the thing. That's key, right? It's, yeah. It's like everyone wanted, everyone in the band wanted to be in a band. Mm -hmm. Go on the road and be a professional musician. Playing, sure. playing original music. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's major. I mean, it's reward in in a way. You know, you gotta you gotta really see that the reward is being able to live a certain life too. Right. 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 And it's a, a life that you want. Like it's sometimes it's hard to keep that in mind when you go through hardships or financial stuff is is tough or whatever. But the fact is, you know, however many nights a year I and we and you know others get to get up in front of whether it's 30 or 5,000 people and play music. And, and we've built our life such that we can continue to do that and eat food and have a roof most of the time. Sure. That's the reward. You know? Yeah, roofs are very nice. Roofs are important. That's <laughs> yeah. ideal. <laughs> Man, so what's the writing process look like for you guys? Um, it is different you know it's different all the time a lot of the time you know dave is certainly the primary voice in the writing process but a lot of the stuff will either be a demo that i'll make or craig will make um and then you know we'll bring it to dave and then he'll write sort of right over it write the lyrics and the melody and add to it and we'll mm -hmm. kind of workshop it together from there that said there's been on like the last record there was like more collaboration than ever which was great like josh has a co-writing credit and as sort of everyone uh, was more involved, mm. right? But again, it, you know, it's filtered through Dave, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is what makes it sound uniform, which is what a band is. Yeah, like, yeah. It's a capital B band is because you have those certain filters, and he's certainly the biggest one for us. Uh, sure. But, uh, so you know, what, like, yeah, we just ahead. did a cool thing, sorry, but we just did a cool thing where we all got together in the studio and... Cause a lot of times like at sound check, we'll just start playing stuff and the groove will be like some slamming groove that just kind of happens. And then we move on and let it go. And so we had the idea, why don't we go in the studio and try to just put together like sound check organic grooves and then have them as starting blocks for writing, which I think is like how chili peppers, I've heard Flea do an interview where he's talking about how chili peppers write like that, which was cool. So we got, I think we got like five or six, you know, songs that we kind of built out of essentially jamming but like focused sort of like what if i do this and you do that sort of jamming you know? yeah well that, that's an interesting thing that like the the kind of even even if you play similar kind of grooves for years that the little variation that pops up in this month or that month tends to change and if you isolate it it right. really becomes a thing and once you put where somebody else is you know with his own vocabulary at that time well, it's you know, it can really lock in with all the time too it's like that's the other key is like we know how to settle into each other's uh you know nooks and crannies of each other's rhythm i think very comfortably so they can have you know you can kind of like there's a baseline sort of rhythmic understanding that just kind of is immediately there mm -hmm. which makes yeah. a little like sort of jam and, and like especially when it's something that's not like for a song or like an improv moment in a arrangement or whatever it's like something that's just like we're at sound check just making sure my bass is working then i start playing something then mikey starts playing something and you naturally sort of can create in a, a cool way i think mm -hmm. and it, because of that familiarity in a way that's can be pretty deep when it's good sure so 2012 you're you got you're with um with that booking agency you're starting to play like tons of shows once what's the next like notch where you started noticing like a real difference and maybe like attendance money like i know it's gradual but like what's yeah. the next thing that happened we've been on a really awesome slow burn this whole time like 
I mean, I'm sure I could pinpoint like certain gigs or things that were like, I, I could like playing Red Rocks was obviously like crazy. Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, playing the Fillmore in San Francisco was crazy. Life. You guys sold it out, dude. Yeah. Uh, the, I think we did once, but it was with New Master Sounds. We just were there. I think we were maybe like 50 tickets short of a sellout. But it was great. It was packed. I'll just buy them. Awesome. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and at the Fillmore, they put the poster up when you get the sellout. So I was thinking, man, I'll just give you guys 300 bucks to put my poster on the wall. <laughs> uh, but, uh, That's awesome. Yeah. But, but, but truly, it has been specifically, and we talk about it a lot, um, you know, when we're talking about business related stuff and just the growth of the band, that this slow burn and this, you know, sort of consistent thing is very crucial towards having a career long term versus having, you know, sort of monumental moments and things that you think, wow, we did this, you know, and well, this thing and we, you know, then we got famous and went all over the world for two years. Yeah, the, the way I like to say, you know, when, when you when you push a career with tons of money, Right. You know, then I, I we always like to call it. It's the the metaphor we use is taking a taking a piece of shit and throwing it up on a pole and then seeing it slowly slide <laughs> <Just> down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're trying. You could really do that. You know, it's like if you have one million dollars for like Facebook ads, it's like everybody's gonna see just like you know, yeah. like there's you know there's a uh, I hate naming names because I'm I'm gonna have people yeah, interview. Uh, there's a certain African American female bassist with a fro that had a very, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, her name, her, her, you know, her last name is like a basketball company. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's Peranza's career, but but I'm saying, not saying anything bad about her music, but but you know, but not talking about her music, but you could see with her career trajectory that she was getting pushed so fucking hard that like you couldn't yeah. escape the name. It was just their day and night, like probably five, six years ago. And then it's like, pow, like it's gone. It's like, what was? Cause uh, is that the case? I, I don't really know that much about her career, but I, it's true that I haven't seen as much stuff with her. She won a Grammy. She was like, you know, I, this, this I, kind I, of I, thing. She was at Berkeley with us. I remember. Yeah. I remember, like, right when I got there, seeing her play and being blown away. Yeah, I remember that two months after she got her poster, it was on the side of the building. <laughs> yeah, her. <laughs> she was like the logo. The female bass players winning everything. <laughs> you remember? Yeah. Claire? You remember? Claire? Oh yeah. 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 She's great. But, yeah, but I'm saying not not saying anything about about her music, but I'm saying yeah. those kind of careers, like, it's really obvious to me when there's like an insane PR budget. Right. right. And it's like getting pushed. And then and the moment it, be, it becomes really obvious is when it's, you know, they stop putting the money in and all of a sudden it's like, whoosh, just like, you know, and kind of uh, everything stops. So I'm, what I'm saying about the slow burn, the kind of audiences and fans that you get doing that are people who are you are a part of their lives. That's exactly my point. And it's, it's a year after year, you know. You, you grow together, you know, like we have, we do a New Year's show every year and we've done it, you know, what I think as long as I get blessed, at least six or seven years, but we have this group, core group of people that were, you know, they were sort of fans in the first place, but have become really close friends. And it's like each year, you know, we, it's, it's already, you grow together when you do it that way, especially you have to keep putting out new music and it has to not suck. But sure. That's, that, that's both, also, both those things are very crucial. But if you do that and you kind of stay consistent and stay a part of people's lives, then you can have a career that kind of reflects that and grows, you know, with your audience and grows with your songwriting and music taste and style, hopefully. Sure. Sure. OK. So what what happened with like, uh, well, not what happened, but like who was the new management? At what point did they step in? How did you get like? This, because you're with like a massive, or the biggest, right? It's like the agency for, for that was booking. Red, red Light Management and um, Paradigm for booking. Paradigm, yeah. And, so, and Paradigm is like a merge. Uh, Paradigm is, yeah, it's sort of a conglomerate. Yeah, well, how, how did that come to be? Like at what so, point were they getting interested in you? You know, there's sort of a, a, there's a behind the scenes version of that story, which I cannot totally tell, but there was sure. actually a time for change. And mm -hmm. they... Jason, who's our manager, uh, 
from Red Light was a friend, and he was Dobapod's manager for a long time, who obviously we were all really, you know, went to college together too, and old friends. And, um, you know, it just, the, the, the fit seemed right. And so we went that direction. Mm. He, he expressed, I mean, you know, there was. He there expressed was, to you how right the fit would be. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you'd have to ask him about that. <laughs> it became clear that that was an option. I'll put it that way. And, yeah. And um, so we, you know, we went that direction and it's been great. You know, there was some, it's so funny. I feel like with management and booking and that kind of thing, it's hard because there's like sort of a lag time to when you actually see the effect of it. So it's like mm. eight months. It's like, is this fucking worth it? And then <laughs> nine months later, you're like, definitely worth it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why they're always in the you know the hot seat because everything's their fault and when everything's right, you know, it's that. Like class. when something goes wrong, you're on the phone with like a company. Just sure. like <laughs> right, it's like this is exactly what's supposed to be happening. We're out here busting our ass. <laughs> That's so funny. It's like it's like calling like your like you know AT and T. It's like this is bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> it's slow on the phone. That I'm this is crazy. I set this up, you know. <laughs> but that said, you know, it's I think that there's like booking and management both doesn't get enough credit and gets too much credit. You know, like people are always asking and talking about it. At the end of the day, it's like if a band's good and they go play shows, more people will come to the shows if they keep playing shows. Like that's all the that matter. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the but, thing that's not that, a given is to survive so long until you're a viable business or a business that shows potential for other people want to, to want to get involved. Right. right. And at that point, making the decision, like I, I mean, I I get the impression you guys have been slim on. You guys have take kept responsibility in house. For, for Martin booking in. We're not in the same boat as you guys right. stylistically, you know, because it's like we, we... That's a reason that it works because we couldn't do it in our scene, but... Well, we didn't have the option. There was no... We, very early on, we got to see, you know, basically what exactly is the machine of jazz fusion, you right. know, like we, the guy that owns Moon Dream Records, Leonardo, I don't know if you know him, uh, you know, he did the booking for Scott Henderson, Frank Bali, like on Holdsworth, and he yeah. was our friend. But did you? Did he never book you guys? Because I know you did tours with them. We, he booked those tours, you know, we, for them, and then he got us as an opener. But uh, but he never booked tours for us, like you know, as a headliner. And right. he couldn't because he people like that don't know how to deal with non marquee names. There's no kind of building of artists. There's just you know, set, calling the venue, being like, he's good for this many tickets. This is the opener. You know, set they set up things. Um, and I think you know, even, even people in the jam scene, even with consider the source, you know, people like that for You're, years, they had a uh, blend of those two. I feel like, yeah, you there's know. a dancey element to yeah. what they do. And there's the light show. There used to be the light show. Right. Do you, are they not traveling with lights now? No, they're not doing that anymore. They, they had enough. Their van actually just died. Very sad story. I've been That's. That's a that's a hard day for any band. Yeah, yeah. It it killed Evans. Uh, the, the that that band uh, the dude from Soul Live, the drummer. What's his name? Oh, Al. Yeah, yeah. When when their van broke, the band okay. ended. Well, I think it was more complicated than that. They're actually <laughs> back together too. Oh, they, are they? they? Just went and recorded. Yeah, yeah, I'm super psyched to hear it. I was talking to Al for a second on Jam Cruise, and uh, he was said, said that whatever they got some really good new material coming out. Nice. Well, they're back. But yes, How was I, Jam Cruise? And died. It was a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Sure. How was Jam Cruise? Insane. Yeah? <laughs> it's always insane. How many uh, have you done? Three, I guess. Yeah, three. Insane uh, in what way? You know, it's just, it's just like, it's hard to describe, but it's just such a mash of like all the artists and all the fans and everyone's like, on top of each other and you know partying it's like crazy and the music is insane you know and then you just see like idols sitting there like eating their little cap like <laughs> cruise ship pasta cafeteria pasta like, it's fucking george porter's just sitting here eating whatever <laughs> it's like george you love pasta don't you i love pasta too <laughs> trying to be cool it's like all right i haven't gotten to sleep don't fucking uh... talk to right now uh, we just did we just did a cruise to the edge, which is like the yeah, the progressive rock thing. Yeah, and and it's like it's a I don't know progressive music so well. This is this is a an honest 
kind of uh, confession, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like 70s stuff. And there are a lot of really famous people that I don't know on the screws and like the artist dining hall. Like I, would, I kept walking around these old people would like block eyes with me like, yeah, that's me. And I was like, I don't know who you are, buddy. <laughs> it's like, you know, that, that was their vibe. Yeah, it's like, like you're thing. young. I knew too much. I was like, I get like weird about, I'm not good at being around people I look up to. Really? Like you if, know, you, if it's. They actually kind of, we have a turquoise song. It's like kind of about that called Murder Face. <laughs> I, because I like always, whenever I see like, whatever, I don't know that I've like transcribed a bunch of their shit. And like I'm super into, it. I'm like, Hey man, like, <laughs> how you doing? You good? <laughs> nice to meet you. It's like, yo, stop fucking murder face in that dude. <laughs> That's so funny, dude. I had the most humiliating second day of Berkeley. I'll never forget this. I was walking around, like, I was walking like in um, Massachusetts Avenue, right by the the Berkeley Performance Center, and I see uh, Steve Smith, the oh, drummer from Journey, and like the fusion. Yeah. I knew him from like uh, Vital Tech Tones. Yeah, yeah. And and I was just like, was great. Yeah, I, I I loved him, dude. And he was he lived in L.A. He was there for like a clinic, uh-huh. you know. And I just saw him on the street, and my seventeen, like eighteen year old, like Israeli mind, <laughs> you know, that like never saw a person from a CD before, just <laughs> immediately started running after him, right? And I was like, hey, hey, man, hey. And he just like looks at me. He's like, yes. And I was like, you're Steve Smith. <laughs> and then he's like looking at me. He's like, yes. Anyway. I just turned around and walked away. I couldn't even like that's that's as far as my brain carried me on that plan. You know what I mean? The rest of it was just pure humiliation. I never done that again. Like, you know, it's I, I just realized that all famous people know their name, so you don't need to tell them. I just get I don't know what I've gotten a lot better about it because I've been lucky enough now to like meet and play with a bunch of the sort of people in the funk, you know, world that I kind of geeked out about for a long time. Um, but certainly those first times interacting and, and really still, I don't do as good a job as I should of just like trying to like be chill, <laughs> but it was, it was a pretty extreme to the point at which people like many people like laughed at me about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you got, you got murder face. It was a, a big fucking joke that it was like, yo, fucking stop. <laughs> like, <you know. laughs> like, yeah, that's me. Joe Parker. You're being fucking weird as hell. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> that's so nice what are you doing in terms of like practice in terms of like playing when you're at home are I you mean, into that i was and i haven't been and I'm, I'm kind of in a zone right now to be honest where i'm feeling uh that that's a problem so i'm i'm kind of I'm, I'm on a, i'm on the new new home practice tip is is what i'm trying i'm trying to get on what what would be like your thing you want to get together that that like has been my like left hand technique has been has been uh, frustrating to me. And actually, the other day I had something really weird happen. We were playing one of those paste um, studio sessions. I don't know if you've seen those. It's like a live no. studio thing. Cool. Um, but uh, my hand like cramped, and I had to use my other hand to open like the, the this muscle mm. like cramped over like this. I, I, I'd been playing. I was in the studio for like two weeks before, and I was just playing on a uh, short scale guild bass like the whole time. And I went back to playing my P bass without having really done anything. My Maloon P bass. I don't know if you've seen that bass. Yeah. I fucking love that thing. But the neck is obviously way bigger. Way bigger, right. And um, you know, I think maybe it had something to do with that. So it kind of cramped. But in general, I feel like you know, I, I want to get more left-handed technique going on. As mm. You should check. You should, are you drinking a lot of water? No. <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes. I've been trying. <laughs> that day? And that, that day I had been actually, which was strange, huh. but yeah. you know, it, I don't know. It freaked me out for sure. It, but I've yeah. been feeling that way about my left hand stuff before that too. It was that you know, was- the best left hand technique tip that, that, uh, you know, it's, it's so, it's really profound actually. It's very Bruce Lee. Um, yeah, let's hear some you know, well, if you if you ha- it's all about the position of the thumb. Right. Well, I I know that I've been trying to focus on that. Yeah, and I well, the idea is that you know you always want to keep your wrist straight. So the only, bad technique has to do with make creating this curve, right? So the idea is that if you're playing the bass side of the guitar, 
the thumb <laughs> needs to be kind of centered on the neck, and then right? Like, it moves as, as you yeah. go up, up, you just rotate outwards. Like if you think about it like a, like a sundial or something, well, it's, like it's pointing you, up. Right, basically when you go to thumb position, you think about thumb right. upright. So that you literally just, is you going all the way up. Like yeah, that. but and, and, and if you're going to thumb position, it's with your elbow. If you're doing right. it with, with a guitar, it's just a rotation of this bone. Right. So, yeah. like, you're going from here to there, right? So it's like the, you know, the the bass side, the treble side. Well, and for so, me, I play, I play, like, you really, dig in. I dig in really hard, which is, you know, something. That as I get older, I'm gonna have to continue to figure out because that's not something that's necessarily. Do you act, do you bust your fingers open ever? Oh I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I've gotten better about it and I like I may I kind of maintain them off the road better than I used to because you know we'd come off like you know two months or something or you know whatever on the road a long time and then not play I would like you know not play for a week maybe play a little bit but playing off the road you know just sitting around playing is so different than like digging in on a two-hour set oh when you're excited it's like electricity going through you yeah and even if I sit in practice my calluses would go away so I've been better about it but mm. I mean, I've bled all over my shit. <laughs> well, the funny thing about playing hard is that it's very hard to have a lot of tension in one hand and none in the other. So and that's the point, because the yeah, left's got to be coming with it. Right. But what I need to work on with the left hand is how to have a softer touch there and not be sort of overexerting. Because the reason mm. that ramps or whatever is from overexerting, and I can see in it, and Craig has mentioned it to me a few times, where he's like, dude, I can just see how hard you're progressing like you don't you should you know that's that's not a winning you know long-term thing yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's that's tough did you ever watch that uh like rocco rocco Pristia, like instructional thing like all the left hand muting stuff he plays very light with his left hand i you know i haven't watched that i don't think i've seen him play and i saw him do a clinic at berkeley one time and asked him questions about his oh yeah he has like a whole thing has, yeah and danny morris you remember danny right yeah best bass teacher in the fucking world uh, <laughs> uh taught was big on the, the left hand muting and and taught me quite a, quite a lot about that so i yeah. still still do a lot of that but he yeah, does, I can hear it. he plays light in a way that i haven't i just need to figure it out i also just um left hand wise want to work on some of just my um harmonic content my harmonic my ability to access some of my some you know, deeper harmony in a one chord or one or three, one to three chord type situation, which is where I am most of the time. Yeah. yeah. And when, with your music, how much freedom is in it? Like how much, how much uh, improvisation goes into it? I mean, you know, a, a lot sort of all the things have, have crystallized, you know, like everything that's crystallized sort of came from playing the song a bunch of times and then be like, Oh, I liked it when that happened. You yeah. Know? Um, so, I, you know, there's sections of every show that are, like, open, but we kind of, you know, we know where we're going to get to. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's not like what we used to do or something where it's, like, actual, sure. ex, you know, odyssey time, you know, where you, like, can find yourself in any type of groove or any yeah, when, chord situation or whatever. When it's free and not even bound by a melody, then it's, like, you know, really, like, you know, there's, there's all sorts of journeys, you know what I mean? Like, a jazz song is, like, going from your house to the grocery store. <laughs> and you can take like whatever road you want. Like you, if you're like you, know, you have to be a psychopath to do it every day in the same, take yeah. the same streets exactly. But like you know what we used to do is just like go out, <laughs> you, <laughs> go you, walk the earth. Grocery store, but there's like a couple ways you could go if you want. <laughs> I mean, uh, like, yeah. For for us, I, for me, I often feel like a lot of the improvisation comes in the execution of the part on an, on a given night. You know, mm -hmm. so like. There'll be either like a rhythm will feel a certain way or I'll add a little extra ghosting to, to a spot or like Mikey will change the way he's playing the thing a little bit. And it'll, so the improv comes a little bit in kind of like seeing what the song is tonight, even though you're playing the same part. That you well, when get. you have so many people that are smart people and cognizant and, you know, skilled musicians that give away that freedom, like the part freedom and have parts you have so, like the brain just goes to such attention to detail mode. Right. 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 And, and then improv comes in how you like play with that, you know? Right. So it's very ornate. Like, you know, you can really hear micro changes in the drums being like, Oh, I really like that hi hat thing you did. Pattern, like, did. And then made me do this. 
Yeah. But yeah. I'm still playing. Don't, 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 the soda. <laughs> but it's maybe, it, you know, it's got some little tweak to it. Um, yeah. And that's, and then, you know, and there's also, there's always, you know, we have open sections where it's like anything. It's not part oriented, but we're definitely not like a jam band. And I, you know, we're not like an improv, like improv. No, it's, it's a range. Thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a range. But but that's why, you know, as I think almost all of us are very improvisationally oriented or interested in improvisational music or come from that between certainly, you know, in the rhythm section and, and in the, you know, with the horn players and stuff. Yeah, uh, definitely. That, um, you know, the, the, the way in which we exercise that feeling comes in how we play the arrangement each night. Right. And I think everyone probably would love to have more even just outside of the band time to be, to, to improvise. I know I, I feel like that's something I'm lacking a little bit. It's just, you know, real uh, improvisational time regularly because it's really important. While you're in New York, go go down the street. Yeah, <laughs> it's I know. everywhere. Here and I'm like, I just want to sleep for like three days and <laughs> I'm back on the road. <laughs> when are you guys heading out again? Tomorrow, or yeah, tomorrow. Or I think I have to sleep on the bus tomorrow night because it's leaving at like 6 a.m. on Thursday. Wow. But we're like in the middle of a tour right now. We just happen to have these three days off and we were in between Charlotte and Burlington. And so it just made sense to stop in New York for the days off. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And many like people, what, what's what's going to be like the next tour after this one? Like how well, long do you have off? Well, so we're going to go into the studio in May and work on a new record. Um, some of that the group writing stuff along with some other stuff we're going to actually put down i think we have maybe 10 recording dates in may and a couple and then it's kind of just scattered shows i guess like june end of june and july i think is like actually is like a month maybe or three weeks out but otherwise we're kind of just like weekends mm. most of the most of the time for us in the summer it makes more sense to just do kind of festival plays and do them you know right. not so fully on the road um, so I'm assuming with that many people, fly dates are like really like out of the questions. No, we do it all the time, but it's, it's really a, yeah, but it's a major financial you know thing. But yeah, we fly date last year. We flew a ton, which was awesome, you know, compared to all the drives that we used to. Do because how do you guys, how do you guys even do that? Like with gear, like it's all backline and we have backline, and we have we all have like our fly either boards and like basically like the bare minimums of what we need to do. Mm -hmm everyone like has uh separate of their touring rig oh dude i gotta show you something i yeah. just dude, this is gonna blow your mind it's a german company that, that check, this, check this out check this out <laughs> is that a switcher oh, that's a, <laughs> it's like it's yeah, it's switchers. tiny it's so yeah, yeah. switcher and then all the pedals underneath it yeah, yeah. it's designed to fit in like an overhead for oh. Are you there? I, I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Can yeah. you see me? Yeah, I got you. All right, good. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So it's designed to go into the yeah. plain overhead. Do you always use a switcher on your pedal board? It's brand new. I got a G2. I, I just that. started using the switcher, and I fucking love it. It's great. Uh, do, do you have this one? No, no. I just have like a um, – it's like a Voodoo Lab. It's not – it's like oh, a – no, no, no. Basic. Dude. Does this one have like all the extra shit in it? Yeah. Oh, I almost it, has, it has everything. It does your amp switching. And, it does can you, your, and can you change your like the the routing? Like, yeah, the routing you can change it just it's, in. But the, but in an insanely easy like it puts everything in loops and it you, do, you don't it, you don't need to hit save or anything. It's just like it's loop one two three and you just punch in the order like pa, 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 right. It's like that, that's bank right. one, bank two and it also and you can layer paddles on. It's it's fun. it's called the G two by the gig rig, sponsored by me. Uh, but <laughs> I had I had the guy who designed it on this show i'm doing that you're on right now and he was like just this crazy guy in australia that had this dream his whole life like a guitarist and he just started like you know it's like a 30 year in the making like project because he saw like all the guys in the 80s with the rack units right. and he said that he saw one that really worked well but it cost at the time like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it took like seven roadies to like lift it <laughs> so he compressed it into like pedal form no, I mean, I, for me, the switcher, the biggest thing with the switcher is just having my clean tone, you know, when the clean. bass clean tone sound right. Do you uh, play like a wet dry rig or? 
No, well, no, I just have, uh, I just have this right now. I just have the switcher with my, with all my different loops on the board. And then it goes into, uh, the Avalon U5, which goes to front of house, uh, directly. And then that goes into just, I just started using a cheap acoustic, like the base company acoustic, like mm-hmm. 250 watt D class head. I was using the, uh, crown power amp for a while, which a lot of people pair that U5 with just the power amps. There's no amp coloration and all the coloration you get is from that unit because it's tight. Um, and I found that that was cool, but having just a little bit of control was helpful. But weirdly, this super cheap head is like totally getting the job done for me. Really? Uh, yeah. And I mean, I have like a, I have like a super nice SVT, like you know, three whatever the, the VR, like you know, what the nicest one you can get. And I think this sounds way better. It's like three hundred bucks. That's awesome. Uh, you know. Yeah, man. So really? and you you guys do the sh- the whole show with like in ears now, right? Yeah. Uh, Danny, can you get one second? I got my power sure. about to die. I just got to put my power cord. One get second. the power. I guess I'll play some music for the people watching. <laughs> You're back? I'm sorry. Beautiful <laughs> <laughs> Had to do something. Tango guitar with the with the small hole. Yeah, yeah. I like that thing. Um, you got to keep it tight. What's that? <laughs> you got to keep that keep those holes small. Okay. Yeah. They tell me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you guys started doing the shit with the in ears. How the fuck do you get used to that? I am not used to. It. <laughs> I, I sort of, I take I take one out every night. It's horrible for my ears. But um, How, why is it horrible for your ears? You blast yourself with it. Well, no, you're not supposed to take, apparently it can like affect your brain because you have a uh, different sound coming in each ear for like long periods of time. It's like, has like, it's, it's, like it makes you crazy. It makes you half crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have like a guy with like a wilted half face. He's like, don't do what I've done, kids. <laughs> Every time I'm, playing, I'm like, I don't get that fucking hi hat better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it um, it it, for, it is for that. Honestly, it's way better than when we had wedges around on the stage because there's like nine of us playing super loud. You know, it, one it made us start to be able to not play super loud because we, you know, what you're hearing is not what you're hearing. Right. So, so that, that's just getting a sound. So, so then it's like then it becomes you know a conversation with our front of house engineer every day like how should i set this not like i want my shit to sound like this <laughs> you know what i mean because it's like because really what he's hearing is, is not similar to what you're doing you know? yeah and you're playing with your amp or whatever turning it a certain way or you know sure differently so it makes the conversation much more about the audience perspective having in ears which is the thing i like the most about it so like the sound conversation is about the way that the show is being perceived not about the way you're perceiving it as much yeah uh, yeah that that's not my bag i mean I, i'm such i'm such a child bag. in but, my mind like i want i want to i want to be in a wonderful spot where the sound is awesome feeling i want to be like yeah, inside I, a tidal wave it's but ideally it's both i guess what i'm saying is when i go <laughs> to change something it's like it's a because that what i'm getting in the ears is, is a direct signal out of my out of the five it's like the changes that I'm making on my cab, let's say, are really more important for what's happening out front, other than just having low end to rumble my butt a little bit. That, but that's so nice. Though, though. Well, yeah, gotta have that. Yeah. Not- <laughs> but, but that's not negotiable. That's a definitely it's not negotiable. I got into this game to have a rumble butt. You know. <laughs> It's like that Homer, Homer Simpson episode where he picks up the bass, like you see the shaking, it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's funny. I, what I, was what? That's why I got into this gangster shit, you know, was having. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> but so, the that, thing is cool because we also all control our own monitoring on our phones. Mm. So the, that's another huge part of it for us is that you know traveling with just we travel with LD front of house. Um, production manager, TM, and um, and Danny that's all filming and merch and all kinds of stuff. But um, you know, not having to have a monitor engineer full time 
is really, really helpful. Yeah. You know, we're just not having another fucking person in our operation, but also it makes it so that people don't have to be doing this ever on stage. You know, everyone's going yeah. to. Uh, so and you can't be in Turkas with a flip phone. No, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, what was your biggest shit show sound disaster on stage? Oh, I mean, there's been so many. I, like, know, like, the like list. What, ha- like, what, hap- what happened, which was I mean, like I'll tell fucking you, awful. I'll, I'll tell you a funny one that just came up. <laughs> we were playing in, I think, Fredericksburg, Maryland, maybe. I've been there. Where are you playing there? I can't remember the name. It was a weird little club. And we show up, and the sound guy, and the, and I think the whole staff, but certainly the sound guy and two other guys, as we're loading in, drop acid clearly in front of us. They're like, do it. Like, hey, we're taking acid now. Crazy, right? We're like, you guys just wired the stage? Like, <laughs> before we traveled with the sound guy, this is like many years ago. And like, nothing's wired. We're loading in. He starts tripping and, like, literally cannot patch anything correctly. So we have to, like, help him do the whole patch. During the show, he's like wandering around looking at the wall while shit's like feeding back. <laughs> there was another time at uh, Sully's in Hartford where this one fucking sound guy who was just an absolute bummer. Would, he would just, he insisted on smoking a cigarette maybe every like two to three minutes of the show. Oh, so he went out? He would go outside. But we were having like wild, I mean, back then, especially when we had, you know, eight wedges on stage and, you know, whatever, probably. 25 open channels like we had a lot of feedback issues you know especially because we have you know four people singing so that you know obviously they need the vocals in the monitors pretty jacked when they're pl- trying to sing over mikey and i and um anyway yeah i just remember there was more Dude. Than night with that guy that was just like, <laughs> and he's out there feedback. like smoking, and we're like we're like waving at him <laughs> It's like, <laughs> send a saxophonist to get him. Come inside, motherfucker. <laughs> My worst fucking, I, we were in Kent, Ohio. Did you guys ever play there? <laughs> and uh, anyway, we were playing this thing. This is like years ago. Nobody fucking knew us, but it was like, we were, we were in the dive bar scene. Mm-hmm. And like, but it was a pretty packed dive bar. So we're really excited like about the like show. This vibe though. That's like right. the show always. Yeah. So it's like, we're like, oh my God, it's like, it's, this is going to be sick. We have an opener. So this fucking guy comes up solo show. He has a violin. It's like a hipster looking dude. He takes the microphone. He throws it on the floor. He starts like tapping on it with his foot, like, and to takes make- the violin just to make like, a banging kind of sound takes the violin, starts screeching, just like no notes. Like, just like, ah! it was like like what makes what's happened when I play with a book. Unlistenable, dude. It was just like in your eyes. It, it created a panic. Like all these girls were like not even paying for their drinks. It's just like rushing out. Like and we're just like standing there, like no, no. It's like, you know, it's like we, we want to play for Pete. It's like. The room is empty, like three minutes into his set. We end up playing like this empty show. The promoter, like, you know, that, that like the booker, like what a promoter, uh, the booker that like we were staying at his house. Not much credit. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and we're staying at his house and he's like, and we're like talking to him, you know. And first of all, he was a weirdo. Like I was falling asleep on a couch and he was sitting in front of me, like on a chair, just watching me. Oh, really? So it was like a creepy yeah. promoter. Yeah, it was a creepy guy. And, uh, but anyway, we're talking and he's like, yeah, people like your kind of music. I'm not into music with notes. I really love the opener though. And we're like, are you shitting me? <laughs> yeah, I actually like that fucking, like, you know, he's an avant-garde guy. <laughs> I have a funny, you just reminded me of a really funny story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I, the first time I think I ever went on tour like, actually, I was, like, 17 with my band from the Bay Area, Tides. We went up and played shows from San Francisco up to Vancouver. And when we played in Seattle, we played uh, this guy. I think the, the guy's name was Greg. But anyway, he was the promoter of the show. And he was a fucking weirdo and invited us all to go back and stay at his house but didn't ask any of his roommates if it was cool. And he had a bunch of roommates. And it was not cool. <laughs> and we got back there, and, and he, of course, somehow got like totally wasted 
and kept doing, uh, like, kept putting us in headlocks. <laughs> we didn't want to leave because, like, we didn't have anywhere to go. We were 17, like, on the road for the first time. Like, nowhere to go in my old van. You remember that van? And, and he, uh, he kept, and then finally, Jordan, and, and Jordan had a crazy bloody nose all over the carpet. And then, his roommate comes down and starts screaming at us. It's like three in the morning and we didn't know what his roommate's name was. And after the roommate's done screaming, this guy sits back on the couch and goes, sorry, spider, dude. <laughs> spider. <laughs> anyway, it's just stuck with me. Like, it's like blood around like, sorry, spider. <laughs> uh, this is the thing. Like, you know, I realized that like, Funny shit will still happen, but the best stories are probably behind us because yeah, yeah. we've all you, figured out how to like not have shit get fucked up all <laughs> so badly. You have to ha- you have to hang out with fucked up people. At the beginning, is, you have to hang out with like exclusively fucking crazy people. It's only the, those stories are only funny if you extract like you plunge into like the cave of chaos as as a semi shit together person and extract the story. Right? right, but it's like right. like the homeless people and like the fucking crazy people on the street have that crazy shit happen to them. That's just their life. I always right? think of the story you told about playing the barbecue with the neo Nazi guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, "Love Alan Holdsworth." <laughs> <laughs> you? Nazi Carl. Yeah, Nazi Carl. <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> yeah, dude, shit like that. Just well, we were just in a real weird situation because you guys were hanging out. You know, relatively, the people, the kind of people that come to your show are the people that like funk, want to dance. We were just fucking playing like bars. Music. Like, you like music? Well, I mean, it's like, you know, it was weird. It's just like a weird collection of people. And sometimes, and we were just staying with whoever. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, we did a lot of that. I mean, I just have done a lot of that in all the bands I've been in. But yeah. That well, is. But, Sleeping on like you know somebody's dirty laundry with whether like iguana looks at you. you know? <laughs> that happened so many times. Yeah, I have had many of those. <laughs> the one thing that really made me realize in the states is like how badly people clean their houses. It's it's pretty. The the state of that with young people is it, pretty insane. It, it, well, especially the type of people that allow you like a band to come stay at their house. <laughs> That's <laughs> probably a correlation. <laughs> There's some correlation there, I think. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, I'd love to have a bunch of strangers come sleep at my house. Like, I'm, I can never do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, touche. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. Man. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's such a, you know, I had uh, Ray from Haken, the drummer from Haken. They're a big metal band right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I know who they are. And, and, uh, you know, he was talking here. And the thing that really blew my mind about their experience is that they got signed fairly early on in their career. They're from London, so they didn't do a lot of touring because Europe doesn't have a circuit like the States. And they were just, like, flying to gigs, right. to all gigs, like, you know, barely, like, doing, like... Vanned it hard and, like, did that whole thing. They never vanned it hard, and they each always had their own hotel rooms. What? And they're like, you know, it's like the, that's not allowed, you know. Yeah, like the way they describe, they like, you know, it's like it's like tell me a story. It's like you know, the stories are like, yeah, we woke up, like, exercised a little bit, <laughs> went out for breakfast together, like you know. You didn't do drugs with a stranger for two days, like in the shit <laughs> hole outside of Ithaca, you know. <laughs> I don't woke up in the bushes. We're on the road. What's the deal? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's like there's a kind of bonding, like you know, when you. I think you get into this mentality that it doesn't matter how shitty of time you're having tonight because tomorrow you're in the van and it resets the day, right? It's like, it's just yeah. get away from it. Right? right, right. You can leave. Well, it's, it's, I don't know. Sometimes I think it's like a negative. Sometimes I think that's not a positive thing in my, in terms of my mental health that I'm so able to just hit like, the reset button. New day, new day. Yeah. It's like, you're not accountable for your actions almost. I mean, that's a little, yeah. No, no, no. It, it does feel like living a million lives. Yeah. You know? yeah. And you make these relationships 
and then you can like pick them back up and then put them down whenever you come to those places. So it is sort of like living a lot of different lives. Or it's exactly that. And there's no expectation to do any sort of maintaining. I mean, I don't know. I, in my personal life, you know, it's like I definitely have some dear relationships that like I've lost, like, you know, with friends from, you know, people will get married and like, you know, they have like you fly, fly to weddings and like all this shit. Man, that shit, uh, even the people that are cool with it, you know, they're cool with it. But like, you know, you've been on the road, like you, you missed a lot of that, that oh, yeah. kind of thing. There's lots of things that, I, you know, there's lots of things I missed. That yeah, I, there's. I, I, I try to maintain my relationships as best I can. I didn't used to be as good about it. And I've, you know, as I'm going through some changes in my personal life, I've made a bit more of a point to follow, follow up and follow through with friends and people from my past. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's a that's a hard lesson to learn. But yeah, I mean, it's like if you want to. That the other truth of that is like you know people that don't make something of themselves, paying dues in their twenties, right. will either never do it or would have to have a very miserable time when their bodies are less apt to. I don't know. Could you? I keep thinking I about it. Like, can't imagine doing it again if that's what you're about to. Say. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's like I thought about like if Marvin ended tomorrow and I had to like join like, a new start- band. You know, Start right? fresh, no name, nothing. I'd do something different. Maybe. Yeah, right. I probably wouldn't do something different, but I don't know. It's like, do, I can't like, imagine, I cannot imagine starting this over again. Yeah, square one. Like square one. I mean, knowing thing, what you know is impossible. I've fun the whole time, and I've enjoyed. You know, so that's what another way to look at it. But, yeah, but it's like I think I think you have like the reason why you really can't do it from scratch is because. You're having fun because you're moving towards an unknown, but now it would be like 10 years to get here. You right. know what I mean? Right. And that, that would be so mentally, dev- it's like, you know, it's It'd like, you know, you're in the bar trying like, to get finally, to the theater. Yeah. No, and I, I mean, I, I think about that sometimes for sure that, you know, yeah, it's just, it's so, it takes so much work. And it's like where we're at, where I'm at now. Is not a, you know, I'm not at the destination by a long shot, you know, like we have a lot sure. of to go. Yeah, and but looking back, like, you know, it's like I, I talk to a lot of people who are just starting out right now. And it's like as shitty as the world was when we started for music. It's, way worse it's now. so no. shitty. I, it's like <laughs> Greg and I were having an interesting talk. He, well, he was just talking about that and like what it is like for new bands to hit the road, you know, that they're just out of college now. And it's like, it's not nearly as good as it was when we started doing it. And it wasn't good when we but started. It wasn't like good then either. It's like been in a free fall for 50 years, right? Yeah. And and it's so uh, that that's just a frightening kind of I was talking to Jonathan Kreisberg uh, yeah. on this thing. He's a jazz guitarist in New York. Okay. Probably lives like around like next apartment. Right. It's like, <laughs> it's like <way>. Jonathan. <laughs> Every jazz musician lives in my fucking neighborhood. Like, <laughs> yeah. So he's he's really well known, and he was he was on Criss Cross Records from like 2002 through okay. 2008. Then he opened his own label, and he okay. said that there was a real golden age between the late like fir- first decade of the 21st century uh-huh. and Spotify. You know, and what what he did is like he just sold his own records. He did sell five, six thousand copies off the bat of anything they released. So it's like 56. It's like a job, right? It's like you make a record. That's like money. Right. And that world existed. But streaming really kind of like just ate that all up. Well, now it's just like ticket sales for bands that people don't already have that relationship. Like we talked about where we have fans that have grown with us for these years, but for them to sort of do that again with new bands it just doesn't happen as much because the younger generation isn't, isn't as interested in people playing instruments, I guess. Well, coming out of our, like our generation, which really like me and you started hitting the road the same time, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, hitting the ground, being released from school in like 2007. It's the, the only viable interpretation was either to be an absolute star and make some big bucks very quickly or do this slow burn road work and just develop develop the relationship with the people that pay the tickets yeah yeah like the, the promoters and the people you develop those relationships and you go around the country and you just keep fucking doing it and you try yeah. to shit grow and it's amazing like you know a lot of people well not so much in your scene but in our scene really invested heavily in europe people moved to berlin people want to do that thing and that that's collapsing like, is that europe the case is- i was gonna ask but I know, I know the snarky guys all 
I've, t- I've talked to, I know Nate pretty well, and talked to mm-hmm. him just in terms of how. It's better audiences, but it's shrinking. Since the terror attacks in France, they went, you know, 60% of nightclubs in, in Paris shut down. What? You know, they, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a lot of people just, people go out less, they're a little scared, you know, and there's right. less business and the club owners like don't, you know, don't want to deal with it. But also, like, think about what it's like to book a tour in Europe where it's like in, in a drive that's half the size of the States, you have like, you know, eight or nine languages. Right. Well, I was going to say how many markets are so close to each other, but the language thing is probably also... That's yeah, the, it's, a, it's a, a lot of barriers. Close, it seems... I mean, I've never gotten a tour over there, so I don't know, but it seems, it seems appealing for sure. But that's not- no. I mean, it's, it's it's an awesome thing to do once, but that a lot of people banked on it as a bread and butter kind of system. And I don't know, the states is just. I, I'm still with the mind that it's the only place to invest in for like a touring band. Right? Really? Just just to, just to do the spinning around here, it's just endless. It's so yeah, huge. It's so big, and there's just. I mean, there's markets every couple hours in any direction. Yeah. yeah, and and that's that's really the truth. And you don't need that many people relative to the population. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's yeah. Like you go to, you go to Houston, it's like you know what I mean. It's like millions of people live there. It's like you need a fraction of one percent to like you. Right, right. Yeah, I think but, we're going to, we're going to Australia and and Tokyo later this year for the first time, which is the fuck, first yeah. Get outside. I actually don't know if that's announced, but. Uh, it's happening. It's announced now. <laughs> whatever the internet, whatever this is going. <laughs> I'm gonna get in big trouble. <laughs> no, um, but that's you know that's the whole conversation of like, all right, so you go to Europe, let's say, or you go to Australia or Japan. It's like, all right, so you have to, the whole point of going there is that you have to go back. So if you're gonna go, it now needs to be part of your, you know, your touring circumference. Right. And, and that's the trickiest part, I think, about adding overseas, or at least for us. I mean, that, it's interesting that you say that the states are the most successful or maybe the most viable. But uh, as a long term thing, as a consistent thing. Right. And that makes sense to me. But it, in terms, because we've just been talking about wanting to add international stuff in general, it's just like what's hard about that is that it just has to then fit into the continuum of your annual thing. You know? Sure, sure. We're, but, but just from a game plan kind of right, like, right. logistically and with time. Yeah, it's time and money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for us, yeah, there, we have we've had many talks about um, you know potentially doing it. Europe. Say again. I'm surprised you guys don't play Europe. Have you done it before? We, no, we well we did we did Canada, Mexico, and Colombia so far um, in terms of international stuff. The thing is, like, we had offers, but like you know, it needs to really make sense. Right. Like, I'm not like we're not about like to do a Hail Mary where we stand to lose. You know what I mean? Like where you get like two great gigs, but barely cover your flights. And you know, there you have to rent a van, get gear. I'm assuming like you have management, so people will take care of that and like show you the bill. Yeah, but you'd have to figure it all out. Sure. Sure, yeah, for us, it's really on us. Our fly date thing, we did did last year, we did figure it out, which is kind of helpful, both for internet, you know, in terms of looking at international stuff, um, but also just in the States. We've, we've figured out a way to do it as, I mean, it's a, we'd spend a lot of money, but it's as slim as possible. Mm. The show suffers as least as possible without having, because we're pretty gear specific and gear oriented people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you go to like a business meeting with your manager? Do you have to wear a suit? No, you... <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> Definitely, that's not what's going down. I'm not going to say what happens at these meetings. They have to no. no. That's so fun. I just imagine you all like, getting a little clean. Just like, right. Right. Let's we'll discuss the Japan strategy. Honestly, I mean, Dave takes takes the point on a majority of, of those. You know, it's really he and our manager, Jason, um, who, you know, spend a lot of the time talking about and, you know, creating the strategy. Mm. there's bigger decisions to be made, you know, than, it, you know, than it gets asked to the group a little bit more for input and stuff like that. But gotcha. It's a huge amount of work. And they, part of that being in this, being in this big of an operation, there's a certain amount of decision making that has to just be like, take care, just do it. Like if we, if everything's like, what does everyone think about this? What does everyone think about <laughs> this? 
Like that does we've tried to do that too, and it doesn't work. Yeah, direct democracies always fail. So and Dave does an incredible job, um, and I give him a lot of credit for his, you know, ability to to uh, try to navigate those two realities. How addicted are you to the to the band social media? I used to be more. Really? I used to be more of like a thing that I mean I don't know addict, yeah, but I used to look at it and I'd be like, cool, you know. We have like a fan site page that's that which is cool, and I usually get updates like when people write long posts, I get updates and so I'll like look at it. Mm. Uh, if, if you're talking about that side of addicted, yeah, to that, media, that. the in terms of the content creation. I feel good about that, but I don't, you know, Danny does most of that stuff. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, and she's yeah. also very talented at it. But, um, you know, I, I think that when I need an ego boost, I can go on the internet and look at stuff, which is nice, I guess. Yeah, dude, you guys put out some incredible stuff, dude. And yeah. It gets to a lot of people. That, that's a good feeling for sure. Um, but but I do, I, I, I try to, I'm not a big social media person in general. Mm -hmm. been trying to get me to do Instagram, which I've been starting to do. But nice. I, I kind of like don't like I don't I don't uh, have like Facebook on my phone. Um, I, I can't imagine that. I look at it through, <sighs> you know, maybe once a day or once every other day or something. Cool, man. That sounds healthy. Yeah, I, you know, I I feel like it's just not really my style. The whole the whole internet thing. <laughs> what, so what do you do all day? I mean, I watch it on my phone. <laughs> Actually, I play Red Dead Redemption 2 a lot. That's amazing. Have Is you it? About this? I haven't played a computer game in a, dec a dec two decades. I, I hadn't played. Uh, this is a little embarrassing uh, that I'm admitting to playing a video no, game. Go ahead. But I uh, hadn't played. The last video game that I played with any regularity was like Mario Kart 64, probably. And this is a PlayStation game, and it's the craziest thing ever. It's like a whole wild real world huge map with like the most beautiful graphics you've ever seen it's like i sat on south park so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, <laughs> i'm i'm serious though if you just if you sat down and saw it or played it for just like five minutes you'd be like what the fuck is this this is so much better than my life fucking I mean, going in there it just is like a high water mark in terms of that kind of thing it's like yeah. the, just came out or something yeah. <laughs> that's awesome it's like you know, it's definitely the best video game that's ever been made. Uh, <laughs> so I've been doing incredible. that we on the bus too. So we were like all playing it on the bus together. Which that's is how, wonderful. How what kind of bus do you guys ride in these days? Just uh, the, it's like a 12 bunk Prevost bus. 12. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's, Very cool. Yeah. It's like, a, it's an older model. It's, you know, it's, it's a little, it's not like a, it's not the top top, but it's really nice. It, it fucking gets the job done for us. And honestly, like having a bunk and not having to do all of our own driving is really nice. I bet. I, I, drove, I bet. I drove so, so, I've driven so many, as I know you have, but just so fucking much over the last 10 years of my life. And Were you the main driver? Uh, well, yeah. So we, for a long time, we did two vans, and I was the main driver of one of those vans. Mm. Who's the other one? Uh, well, the other van... Josh and Chris did a majority of the driving, and then in the van, uh, sometimes you know, then a few other people would jump in there. Craig and, and Mikey would sometimes mm. in there, and, and we would rotate a little bit. But I did a lot of driving for sure. And and I yeah. still when we when we do fly dates and stuff, and and have rentals, and anytime we're not on the bus, which is basically any show that's not in a you know a longer stretch of shows, I still do all the driving or yeah. a big chunk of driving. Awesome. Well, Taylor. Thank you for your time, dude. This Thanks. is so wonderful. <laughs> Buddy, it's so, this is fun. I've never had a conversation on a computer like this before. Well, you know, it's like it, there's a camera right there for a reason. God made it that way on the eighth day, and now he's yeah. resting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So we'll post it. People can check you out where? Uh, turquoiseband.com. T-U-R-K-U-A-Z band.com is where I'm Nice. We can, we can do like a little overlay <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I'm literally <laughs> taking it and putting it on. <laughs> yeah, turquoiseband.com. And, um, you know, so nice to get to hang with my good buddy. Yeah. Much kisses. <laughs> See you soon, man. Peace, man. Bye-bye.